It's working. Hello. Hey, Pamela, how's it going? It's going okay. How are things going there? So cold. It's outrageously cold here. Okay, how cold is it? Minus 12. Okay, we're about the same. Yeah, not right. It's not It's not right. Now, my, I have some friends in Saskatoon, and it's minus 44 there. So, and what's great is that I don't have to say whether it's Celsius or Fahrenheit, because it's pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah, minus 40 is the, the point at which they cross rather yeah. horrifyingly. And as expected, nobody leaves. I mean, it's literally the surface of Pluto out there, so... <clears throat> Yeah, no, it's... It, but no, here, the surface of Pluto is actually colder, but yeah, it's brutal. Yeah. I, I am having fun watching people out in California whine about how terribly cold it is, and, and I informed a few people earlier today, or by a few, I mean one, uh, Surly Amy on, on Twitter, that, that she's not actually freezing her hiney off, she's chilling her hiney currently. Right, right, it's still, it's still above freezing temperature. Yeah, yes. I know I'm like worried about the pipes freezing, and yeah, oh. it's, yeah it's, pretty, it's pretty dangerous. Um, yeah. Uh, but... There's ice. You can skate. It's fun. So, um, so if uh, nobody has any idea what it is that they've stumbled into, this is a live episode of Astronomy Cast, which is our weekly uh, astronomy, space and astronomy show, where Pamela brings her great big brain to uh, to the conversation, and I ask her whatever strikes my fancy, and uh, you will watch in awe and shock as she is able to handle all the questions that I throw at her, or occasionally looks them up. Uh, but uh, yeah, and so we'll take about half an hour. Now, normally we stick around for a lot of sort of question time. I know you don't have a lot of time, so we will like stick around for just a couple of questions, and we'll probably have to to, to shut things down. So, uh, but if you do want to ask us questions, the method that we are now attempting to push people towards is the Q and A app, which is embedded now everywhere. This is being seen on YouTube, I hope. So uh, you should be able to see that. Uh, and for example... Unless you're on the mobile app, in which case, tweet at me. Tweet at... Sure, yeah. Either tweet at AstronomyCast or tweet at Starstrider, and uh, and hopefully we'll get that question as well. And then you can just say that you saw the question and, and, and bring it in. Um, so for example here, Alexi Nitsa has asked, Hi, I'd like to ask you if you believe about a Mars colony. Do you believe in it? Uh, is there a colony on Mars currently? No. Mm -hmm. Do we think it will happen someday? Yes. Maybe. Yes. So, uh, I believe in Elon Musk. Me too, boy. Walking around SpaceX, they sure, they <laughs> sure believe it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there you go. That's how the Q and A app works. So if you want to ask a question, go ahead. But we won't get through too many. So I'll we'll just pick some really good ones and then we gotta wrap it up. So vote, because you have the power to do that. You yeah, you can decide could vote. what we're answering. Yeah, and then there. I know there was conversations that happened in other places, like on Twitter on YouTube, in the event page, on Google+, in the shared version. That, anyway, the only place that I will be checking for questions is in the Q&A app. That's I'm just I'm making a stand. I, my brain can't handle that, that much, you know, that much. And the only place I look or, is Twitter. Yeah, okay. During Perfect. the show. I look other places other times. Awesome. Um, okay, great. So are you ready to go? I hope so. Okay. Say one. Um, I am pressing record. It I've is also record. actually recording. Perfect. Ready. Okay, here we go. Let's get my words. <laughs> Astronomy Cast, episode 325, Cold Fusion. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Great. Very cold. It's, it's, uh, it's not right. It's colder than it's been in years here, so... Yeah, we're just having winter. It, it came early, but... It's a white. It's going to be a white Christmas, I predict. We have about two inches right now. Yeah, we've got a little snow too, and it's frozen solid, and it's it's awful. I don't like it. I don't like this much cold. <laughs> um, so 
I just want to thank everybody for posting comments. There's lots of really great stuff, lots of great feedback and ratings on iTunes. And in fact, I don't know if you noticed, Pamela, we actually got into the what's hot area of iTunes. So if people are in the UK or in the I'm US... I'm recording with entirely the wrong mic. What? Oh, okay, let's start again then. Sorry, audience. Why I'm not the did right it mic? do that? I am. Okay. GarageBand, like, don't... Sp- Shush, I know what you're going to say. GarageBand, like, randomly grabbed my conference camera, and I don't know why. We're going to start again. Yes. I made sure that I was in mono. From the conference cam? Yes. Which looks terrific, by the way. It look, It does not record terrific. No, I'm sure it doesn't. I was looking at my, my, my wave functions, and I'm like, what the hell? Okay. I'm pressing record on the correct camera or microphone, and I have healthy-looking audio now. Okay, good. Yep, okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 325, Cold Fusion. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I'm doing well. I feel like a space cadet, and I'm going to blame all the winter weather for freezing my brain cells. You totally should. I, it's awful, just awful <laughs> cold. I think everyone's experienced it. Like, it's like storms in the east, and it's yeah. just been a real cold snap here on the west coast. We've gotten down to minus 12 Celsius, which, you know, for the people in the middle of Canada, they just laugh at me. But minus 12 is cold. It's, it, 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 yeah. it, it, I, I admit, I slid backwards out of my driveway rather than rolling out of my driveway this morning. Yeah, when you get this kind of what warms up during the day and then it gets really cold at night and then you just get this black ice that forms and it's a yeah, it's a disaster. Yeah. So I just want to thank everyone for uh, giving us a rating and a review on iTunes. It we really appreciate it. We got a ton of great reviews, uh, and in fact, we sort of ended up on the what's hot lists for the U.S. and for U.K. and uh, Which and that was, was great. Awesome. Yeah, so great. So there was so screen th- capturing. So thanks again, um, and uh, and then also I just want to remind you that you can, of course, you can subscribe to us on 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 iTunes or just using our podcast R- RSS feed. But also you can subscribe to us through YouTube. And so if you're on the Astrosphere Vids channel, make sure you subscribe on YouTube, and then you will get notifications for all of the, these shows and all the other shows that we do through CosmoQuest and Astrosphere and Universe Today, and it's it's good stuff. So, uh, And now I know a lot of people also were wondering where do they find the Weekly Space Hangout, the audio-only feed of it, you can get that through the 365 Days of Astronomy feed. So if you subscribe to that, then you'll get the uh, that every week as well. All right, let's get rolling. So the universe is filled with hot fusion in the cores of stars, and scientists have even been able to replicate the stellar process in expensive experiments. But wouldn't it be amazing if you could produce energy from fusion without all that equipment and high temperatures and pressures? Pons and Fleischmann announced exactly that back in 1989 but things didn't quite turn out as planned. So before we kind of get into what cold fusion is, let's get let's talk about what hot fusion is. So what's going on in the process of hot fusion? Well, with with hot fusion, we have uh, very hot dense places like well, the center of the sun. And in these hot dense places, uh, atoms are getting crushed together such that um, you end up with two hydrogen atoms combining to form helium. Uh, You'll end up with carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen getting produced. And this is because at those high temperatures, things are moving really, really fast. And at these high densities, um, it's impossible for these things not to get so close together that they overcome the, the normal repulsive forces that cause protons not to collide. And when you get those protons close enough together, the strong force is able to take over and glue them with gluons into new atoms. But the great part is that energy pours out of yes. this process. Wouldn't that be amazing? So so scientists have attempted to replicate this process with experiments here on Earth. And, and that's actually going really well. I mean, it's always 30 years off, right? But, but so where are we <laughs> the state of, of hot fusion here, you know, experiments? 
So, so with hot fusion, there, there's laboratory reactions. There always have been. You pour in more energy than you get out, but you can study how fusion happens. You can study what are the byproducts, uh, what ratios do you get things. You can confirm all the math works. There's some really neat plans where they're trying to use lasers to compress small glass beads that have stuff in them. Exactly what the stuff is depends on the experiment. And they're trying to zot these small glass beads from pretty much all sides at once with multiple high energy lasers. And the idea is that if you pulse the laser at the glass bead, you'll get fusion inside the glass bead, release huge amounts of energy, and maybe this is the pathway for hot fusion as an energy source on Earth. So far it's not working. Lots of people think it's never going to work, but hey, it's giant lasers, so the DOD keeps paying for it. Right, but I mean the holy grail of course is just that the the net energy is positive, that you may have to pump in mountains and mountains of energy through these lasers to heat up these glass beads, but, but by doing that fusion process you will unlock this process that happens in the sun and, and energy will pour out. And, 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 and more importantly though, it's clean energy. Yes. When we have normal nuclear power reactors that, that are burning whatever particular thing they're burning, they're giving off all sorts of really nasty radioactive byproducts that end up if, in some cases spilling, in other cases just piling up because we don't know where to put it. And these nuclear byproducts are, are hot, are giving off deadly radiation for upwards of hundreds of thousands of years with fusion. It's, it's like hydrogen giving off helium. We're kind of good with helium. We, we need, need it. Helium. We're running out of yeah. it. Yeah, let's you know, fill some balloons with it. So, Okay, so then let's talk about cold fusion. So, you know, I guess in theory, right, this is great. You don't need you know, some other process that crushes atoms together and produces <laughs> byproducts that doesn't require gigantic lasers and enormous facilities and, right? Well, you still have to crush them together. The trick's finding a way to crush those hydrogen atoms together without needing, well, star-like temperatures. And, uh, well, it's the star-like temperatures take vast amounts of energy to create, but you do have to have some way to crush the atoms. So tell me a story, Pamela. <laughs> tell me a story about cold fusion. So there's this metal called palladium. And uh, being a bit dyslexic, my, my brain sees this word and wants to turn it into paladin every time I see it, which the idea of like this shining hero coming to rescue us with, with cold energy just somehow. Anyways, that's where my psychosis goes in the morning. It's, um, it's totally lawful good. I totally, I totally agree. <laughs> so you have this, me you have this metal, uh, palladium, and it was recognized that palladium will happily let hydrogen into its matrix. You have this metal um, and hydrogen can get in. Okay, that's kind of boring. So what? But this got people to thinking, if, if I have a chunk of palladium, what if I could cram the hydrogen into the palladium so densely that within the palladium metals I could get fusion going on. And this idea has been kicking around pretty much since the 70s. There was a patent placed on the idea. And so what happened was eventually, Pons and Fleischmann, they took a calorimeter. This is something that most of us had to build at some point in high school biology class or chemistry class. And uh, you can use a calorimeter to measure how much energy is coming out of something by measuring the energy very, very precisely. Temperature is another way of looking at em energy. And so they took this very well insulated, very precise measuring calorimeter and filled it with heavy water. This is water that instead of having normal plain Jane hydrogen with no neutrons instead has deuterium. And they thought that if you had an electrolyte and deuterium in the, the doer and you then ran electricity through this 
fluid. So you have on the wall of the calorimeter what's called an anode. This is a positively charged surface. Then you have into the center of the calorimeter a cathode. This is a negatively charged surface that you could get the hydrogen off of the water, in this case deuterium off of the water, and deuterium fuses at a lower energy than normal hydrogen. This is why they are using the heavy water. So if you have the heavy water, the palladium will happily, on the negatively charged cathode, suck in the hydrogen, electromagnetic force, tears the, the molecules apart, the oxygen goes to the anode, the hydrogen goes into the cathode, cramming together in the cathode. And the thought was that if you do this over a long period of time, just keep flowing the electricity through the system, you'd build up the hydrogen until fusion took place. And the claims that have been made by more than one uh, not at a top-ranked research center scientists. So these claims have been made multiple times, but the experiment has never proven out at any of the big name top research centers that have tried it. The claim has been made that if you flow the electricity through the system long enough, you'll have this nice standard 30 degree Celsius experiment going and going and going and all of a sudden zap. It jumps up to 50 degrees Celsius and off and on, off and on, the temperature fluctuates until it appears that the fusion reaction has ended. Um, and that's when all the deuterium in theory is used up. So this, this is the claim that has been made. Right. And so, you know, were you around when, I mean, do you recall when Pons and Fleischmann made their announcement? And I, I remember seeing it on the news right before I was supposed to go get the bus to go to school. I, I was a kid. Yeah. But I, oh, what was but I remember this occurring because it was like, it was on the Today Show, it it was it was all over. This was the the key to, to clean energy and, and so this was a uh, kid. I was ninth grade when this happened and this was, I want to say this was well before uh, the movie The Saint came out, which was kind of based on this idea, the idea of cold fusion, except uh, the woman they had playing the part of the scientist was much sexier. Right. Well, and the thing is, it's like, so Pons and Fletcher, I mean, they they kind of went about it wrong, right? Which is that the way they they announced this to the world was not in the way scientists traditionally run through, run out their experiments, especially something so dramatic as this. They, like, held a big press conference yeah, and announced it, which was not not the right way to go well, about it. Well, and and there was another problem to it. There was another group that had been working at another uh, research facility in Utah, and they had similar research. The two groups had been talking to each other. They were going to be submitting a pair of papers. There was an agreement that they were going to meet at an airport, FedEx their papers to the journal Nature together. And unfortunately the University of Utah, according to some reports, uh, pressured Pons and Fleischmann, and so this is university politics playing a role pressured Pons and Fleischmann into not doing the upright thing and submitting the paper for joint publication along with this other research team. And so they just went to the press. And Pons and Fleischmann, I mean, they were some of the world's leading electrochemists. I mean, they are yeah. not pseudoscientists. No. And, and, and so I'm sure it for them it really was a difficult decision to go that way. Yeah, they're, they're at a PhD granting university, the University of Utah. It's not a university to be shrugged at. It's, it's a, these are solid scientists doing solid work, planning to put it through peer review, planning to do everything right. But this is the type of thing where other teams have had patents for similar, relate, for similar work where if what they had done had proved right, the University of Utah, if they were able to patent the process, would have made billions and billions of dollars. Trillions. I mean, all free energy? Like, it's insane, right? Well, it's not free. 
Well, in net positive energy. <laughs> I mean, energy. Sure, cheap energy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would have made, as you said, billions or trillions. Energy. Free it's energy. energy. Well, well, oh, we'll get on to free energy in a bit here. I didn't say free. I said pollution free. Pollution free. No, no. But we're going to get to free energy. I want to talk about free energy too. But, <laughs> but, uh, um, right. So and so then they made their announcement, right? Yeah, and and everyone jumped on it. It it was an amazing story, and pretty much overnight. Major research institutions all over the world started trying to replicate what they'd heard based on the scant information that had been published. And that's that's another one of the, the problems is when you're publishing something like this, you want to, to lay it all out. You have the detailed schematics, you explain the energy in, you explain the energy out, you explain what equipment you used, how you measured this, what the what the errors are, what the errors are here, how you verified this, how you verified that. You want all the checks yeah. and balances in so that you know what issues there might be. And and there's actually been a whole bunch of top done papers on this that have over and over had to be retracted because Upon further review, it was realized, oh, there was something wrong with my temperature gauge. Oh, there was a short in my wiring. Oh, all these little things that were able to be discovered later. Pons and Fleischmann didn't have that. Yeah, and, and in many cases, so had they, I mean, they hadn't gone through the traditional peer review process, right? They hadn't given this to a bunch of people, asked them to replicate the experiment or find the problems. And even a lot of the cases... You know, as scientists, it's very, like, here's the thing we found. It's probably not true, but please poke some holes in it or yeah. see if this helps you out. But the university would just run with it, and the press went bonkers with it. Well, it, it did get submitted for, for peer review. It went to the Journal of Electroanalytical Chemistry. Um, it's not nature, but then again, Nature's a journal where lots of papers have to get retracted because it turns out the research was just premature. Um, so it, it did go through peer review and they tried. They tried to be legitimate scientists. Um, they tried to do everything right. Somewhere there's a mistake and I don't think anyone will ever know what went wrong with their experiments. And there was an error that led their university, because there's always some press officer going, hey, you got something, hey, you got something, and you have to let the press officers know at least 30 days in advance or they get upset. Um, and there was university pressure. So you have scientists trying to do it right, trying to go through peer review, trying to put everything out there correctly, getting pushed to publication early, having to break their agreements with other scientists, We'll never know what went wrong, other than people saw dollar signs. Yeah. Uh, and so what now do we think was going on? Um, this is actually what's called a pathological science. It's, it's an area of science that the people engaged in the field refuse to give up, no matter how much evidence you give them that the, the tree you are barking up does not contain squirrels. They, they, they keep chasing after cold fusion using electrolysis. Various government agencies keep, keep throwing small amounts of money at the problem. Uh, but so far, it's not working. There are related fields, uh, electrolysis, um, doesn't seem to be the way to get low temperature fusion, but other people have tried a process called bubble fusion, which is where you grow ever larger uh, bubbles in a fluid, uh, special chemicals get used, and when the bubbles burst uh, during a process called cavitation, you can potentially, um, if you have correctly deuterated material that will um, so this is a fluid that's enriched with deuterium. Um, when when it collapses, uh, the deuterium gets smashed together. Perhaps you'll get fusion. Um, this is another route people are going. There was, again, a publication put out. This time it did show up in science. Um, but no one's been able to replicate those results either. And so we're in, we're in a position where 
you have people who think they've replicated the work, they think they proved it right, they think they did it. No. So we're trying. But it's not the kind of, I mean, it's not the kind of research that has gone away completely. I mean, in the time, I mean, when, when I started Universe Today, it was still, whatever, 10 years after the announcement from Pons and Fleischmann. We've been doing it for 15 years. And occasionally, interesting press releases come out and say that they're, that it, it won't but completely all die. because a press officer can write a good press release does Maybe. not mean the science is good. People still look for the Holy Grail. We call mm -hmm. them crazy. <laughs> right. Well, there are still hundred. I mean, there are still hundreds of people working in this area. So it's not completely, completely. I guess not. Everyone has just decided that's it. It's ridiculous. I'm not going to work on it anymore. I, I don't think it's hundreds of people. I think it's hundreds of thousands of dollars get spent on this every year. This, this is low budget research that's not getting that supported, that doesn't have mainline research papers that often there's every few years conferences on it to see, okay, is this something we should continue doing? And it's, it's just not proving tractable to at room temperatures, compress deuterium atoms that close together. Um, we're, we're just not finding a physical mechanism to do it. Yeah, and at this point, the funding, as you said, it's now hundreds of thousands. The funding is really drying up. Yeah. There are some recommendations. I know that like the Department of Energy or Department yeah. of Defense has been looking for money, but it's all starting to peter out. Yeah. And, and this one is mostly funded through the Department of Energy. DOD likes the um, big laser fusion projects. Uh, they like lasers. Um, it's, it's kind of painful to watch in a way. The, the bubble cavitation, I think, is really interesting because there, there's lots of interesting physics going on. But it doesn't seem like a way to get continued reactions to take place. Yeah. The cold so, fusion with electrolysis just doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, and so I think at this point, unless something really interesting happens, it's just going to continue to sort of settle down and eventually just completely leave the the mainstream research. I think we're just waiting for that generation of scientists to die. <laughs> right, as as always. Um, but then, I mean, I think what's what's important as well is the that as it, it had all the trappings, I think, of a more of a pseudoscience type thing that we see a lot of, even to this day, that every now and then someone says they're, they're about to test some kind of free energy, uh, energy from water, uh, some kind of machine that's going to produce energy that's a net positive, perpetual motion. And I think there's a standard way that we need to approach all this stuff, which is skeptically. Well... With cold fusion, it's, it's one of those borderland sciences. There's no reason at the surface that you shouldn't be able to find a low temperature way to get the needed densities. The only question is how? And it turns out that the how uh, doesn't actually seem to possible with any of the technologies we've tried. Yeah. So how should people approach this It isn't this to say that we want some fine. Is there an underlying physics that can explain what's going on? If you have to rewrite the rules of physics, it's probably pseudoscience. If there's underlying physics that says this technique is physically allowed, we just don't know if it will mechanically work. And that's what we're facing is it doesn't seem to mechanically work but it's physically allowed with these processes. If, if the physics exists, then it becomes a, a question of, huh, can you do it? And it's the can you do it where we're failing. So do you think then that it's always going to be impossible, or do you think that at some point, if people do keep cranking away at it, someone will come up with a, a way to approach it? I think that we've pretty much played out the using palladium and electrolysis. That, that is not leading to anything, and we keep trying it. And no, um, I am more 
um, willing to look at the bubble cavitation research. Um, the bubbles collapsing, I think that's something that we're still figuring out that was only started in 2002. Um, but I'd want to see that research taking place if you're going to fund it within an environment where what you're trying to study actually is what's the physics of bubble cavitation. Uh, you're not funding the we're going to find low cost energy um, so that we can understand the physics of that better. What I think there's space for is to find new technologies, perhaps new ways to use magnetic fields, new ways uh, to cram things together that will lead to fusion at lower temperatures. Um, there's an awful lot of time to figure out technologies that can squish atoms together. I give us time. Yeah, and you never know how this stuff's going to come back around and play out in ways that maybe we had no expectations. Right. So, yeah, and it's it's too bad that the whole now, if you're hooking up some heavy water in an experiment and you're trying to crush it together and you're using palladium, then your funding all gets cut. When there's interest, as you said, there's interesting research to be done in the cavitation and about using a matrix, a metal matrix for, for cramming hydrogen together. I mean, this kind of work should still get done. Well, I, I think we're kind of done figuring out the palladium. Um, yeah, but a new matrix, maybe. Yeah, it's... <laughs> the thing about asking for funding is you have to always present what's new about what I'm doing, what results do I think I'm going to see, what research am I building on, what are the physical rules that allow what I'm predicting to happen. People can put in to do innovative research and the peer review system should be good enough it's not always but it should be good enough to say this idea over here let's give them seed funding to try it okay the seed funding worked let's scale this up that's how funding should work and the people who have crazy ideas for infinite energy that breaks the rules of physics they're not going to get funded but when you have legitimate researchers who have the infrastructure of a large public institution like Pons and Fleischmann had, if they have a valid idea, trying that idea, we shouldn't be afraid to try new things, but we also need to stop funding things that we know aren't working. That's what and, peer review does. And I think the media you know, as a member of the media, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, you know, I try to encourage this: is this skepticism, this that when, a, when people make these kinds of claims, when it's presented in a way that's unusual, to be extra skeptical, and that's when we, as the media, need to bring in a lot of those weasel words, you know. Yeah. And and we need to say these people are reporting. This might be happening. A lot of people are skeptical. Here's what other people think and to get and to really approach this almost like we've been invited to the peer review and to say, "Hey, I know you say you think this stuff is true and and I, you know, I'm not an electrochemist, so I can't necessarily decide whether or not what you're saying is real or not, but I can at least know that every time someone has tried to make that kind of a presentation in the past, here's how it often plays out and yeah, you know, and let's work together, us as the people who are trying to publicize what you're doing, yeah. to make sure that it that it's a lot smoother and and you know there are certain hoops that must be jumped through. And and the question I think you have to ask of every website you go to, every press release you read, is where's the money trail? And if you find that the press release that you're looking at is one that if it's successful has the potential for the university to get large contracts to continue this research for commercial firms be skeptical if it's bragging yeah. rights for intellectual merit I think that's kinda cool and so when it comes to science sometimes you have to be more skeptical the more likely money is at play and that's I true love just about the everything yeah, and I love the the first rule of uh, of questions in headlines. Have you ever heard this? No, I haven't. That if you ever see a question in a headline, like "Have astronomers discovered another Earth?" No, or whatever. The answer is always no. So if if the if the headline is a question, the answer is no. So you've you know you don't need to read the article. So yeah, it works. Awesome. Well, thanks, Pamela. <laughs> My pleasure.
Okay, pressing save on the recording. Yeah. We have no questions on Twitter at this time. Okay, we have lots in the Q and A app. So, cool. Yeah, we do have. I am she powerful, which is a really cool username saying that she's watching live. Um. Um. Okay, I can quit this. I have saved. There. Exported. And I'm going to upload, and then we're free, safe. My coffee cup still has coffee. Mine would be frozen. I didn't go up to the attic because I just couldn't bring myself to go up someplace so cold. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm now uploading. So I'm good. We're safe. All right, so let's see. Um, MMO Saga says, is this live? Yes. Yes. This is live. Um, Graham Stickings asks, would not the best way of harnessing fusion be through improved solar power generation? After all, that doesn't harness the fusion be done by our local star. Yes, and, and actually that's where a lot of research money is going into is to make more and more efficient solar cells. And they're getting a lot better. I, I'm really impressed with nations like Greece that when you drive through the nation you see uh, grape farms, olive orchards, and solar panel farms. I wish I saw more of that here in America. Well, the great thing about uh, solar power is that it becomes a a computer problem becomes a semiconductor problem and so you know improve it's the same thing with LEDs like like the price of LEDs have just been going down yeah. and down and down and the the performance has gotten better and it's the same thing with solar panels like once you turn these into computer chips then the, and the manufacturing process then all of the this, this sort of decrease in cost and multiplication of efficiency just takes hold of this whole process. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. But still, I mean, you know, a great big fusion plant to give us nice base load power would be awesome. So it's both and need to be done. And winter happens. Yeah, we just need to wait 30 years, that's all, and then we'll have our fusion. So uh, <laughs> Rus Russell Bateman loves the mug. What's the mug? Raise the mug. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to get a takedown notice from Disney. Aww. I also have an Eeyore one, so you can match my mood by whether I'm t Tigger or Eeyore. Um, let's see. Uh, Thomas Stranaker says solar energy is starting to be interesting. It's just a matter of disrupting and collecting. So We have Martin on Twitter just asked, are there any other interesting potential new energy techniques out there other than fusion? Oh, man. Um, there's so Hot much rock research. geothermal. Yeah, Iceland's doing some interesting stuff with that. There, there's actually been some experiments outside of Reykjavik where they've been pumping water down yeah. to the lava layers, and this triggers massive uh, sets of, of small grade earthquakes. Um, right. I, I personally find that uh, messing with lava in Iceland kind of seems like you're going to bring down the wrath of like Loki or something. But uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of really interesting work going on trying to figure out if we can capture the, the thermal gradient of our own planet. Uh, yeah, so the cool thing about hot rock geothermal is it doesn't need to be places where the where it's all venting up to the surface like it is in Iceland. Like there's places in Australia, places in Canada where you just drill down and then you fire pour water or some kind of heat conducting liquid through the you know next to the hot rock and then it comes back up superheated and you use it as steam and then once that energy runs out and you've like cooled down the whole area, you can just move to a different place and then it heats up again in 20, 30 years, right? So it's it's really exciting. And also there's some really neat stuff just in tidal. There's some great, you know, almost like wind oh, farms, yeah. but underwater tidal farms, which sort of work the same way that the, yeah, the tides come pump. in and yeah, yeah, the tides come in and, and the machine runs one way and then the tide goes out and the machine just turns around and just the water runs the other way. So I... I think a lot of this stuff, I mean, it really just takes a commitment to say we're going to use renewable sources by any means necessary. And, I think and, and if you 
go anywhere in in Asia except maybe Japan, you're going to see why we've got to switch. The, the air in places, Indonesia is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. If there is some place you can put a plant, they've put a plant there. This includes like on the sides of walls. But all of the atmosphere is completely toxic from all of the pollutions and we, we can't have the places on our planet that are the most dense with people also being the most polluted or we're going to destroy well, our next generation, basically. Yeah, so we should really work on like cold fusion or something to solve that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I know you got to run, so why don't we wrap this up. So, so sorry to everyone, we didn't get a chance to get to your uh, questions, uh, but feel free to continue the conversation in the event page on YouTube and on Google Plus, and uh, so thank you everyone for watching. We really appreciate it, and we love having you guys join us live. It's great to sort of be doing this in front of an audience. So, uh, next up, Wednesday, learning space. Learning space. Friday, space hangout, and then I don't know what's going to happen with Christmas. So. Yeah, we'll figure that out. Awesome. Well, great to see you, Pamela, and we'll see okay. all of you next time. Bye bye.